So what do we need universal protection? We can't approach a far western lineage residing on land that includes the ancestral territory of many indigenous people, including the Shawnee, Lenape, Delaware, Haudenosaunee, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, Tuscarora, and Cherokee. By acknowledging this, we recognize and appreciate these indigenous nations whose territories we are living and working on. Indigenous peoples have been of the land currently known as West Virginia since time immemorial. It is important to understand the context that has brought our university community who reside here on this land and of our place within this long history. By acknowledging this, we endeavor to always seek the truth about who we have been, who we are now, and who we can become. The West Virginia University resides on the land that includes the ancestral territory of me. Me? <laughs> there we go. How many people love technology? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Well, welcome everyone to the annual Dean Distinguished Lecture by Marie Cochran. And Marie, welcome to you especially. Thank you for joining us. My name's Christina Olson. I'm director of the School of Art and Design. And I want to say just a bit about who the deans are and then turn things over to my colleague, Dr. R Rhonda Raymond, to give Marie's introduction. I have to thank Rhonda for um, nominating Marie for this uh, year's lecture. And a uh, shout out as well to our colleagues, Shalaya Marsh, we give a wave, and Dylan Collins for all their work to coordinate Marie's visit and exhibition. <laughs> And I hope you'll all join us after the talk in the lobby where you can view Marie's documentary and join us in celebrating uh, her lecture. All right. Marie is the 28th lecturer to be supported by Allison and Patrick Deem. They couldn't be here this year, but I believe they're watching online. The Deems have been supporting the College of Creative Arts since 1990. Um, through more initiatives than I could possibly name here, but they include scholarships for our students, an endowed professorship for art and design faculty, and since 1995, this lectureship. Um, and even though the uh, Dean's uh, financial support has been essential for the college and certainly for the School of Art and Design, they do a lot more than just write big checks. <laughs> Allison, in fact, has been a dedicated, um, given dedicated service to the college in numerous roles, including serving on the visiting committee and working as a docent doing educational tours for the art museum. In 2013, WVU inducted her into the Order of Vandalia, the university's highest honor for service to the institution, well deserved. So it is more than appropriate that an artist advocate like Marie Cochran carry the title of Deemed Distinguished Lecturer this year, a title that has been shared with other outstanding artists like Willie Cole, Anne Hamilton, James Luna, Mel Chin, Antoinette Carroll, and last year, Roberta Lugo. Pretty august company. Allison and Pat, we can never thank you enough for making it possible for us to bring these artists to our students. And I thought if we could just let them hear our gratitude by a round of applause. We love you guys. All right, let me turn things over to Rhonda who will uh, give our introduction and uh, then on to Marie's talk. I am pleased and honored to introduce the 2022-23 Deemed Distinguished Lecturer, Marie Cochran. Marie is a social documentarian, writer, curator, mentor teacher, self-described uh, cultural pollinator, and of course, artist. 
which I'll talk about in a little bit. But first, I'd like to take a moment to highlight her poetic, evocative, sad, hopeful, and revealing artwork, Testify Beyond Place, which is upstairs in the, in the Sorrows Gallery. This is a particularly fitting work for the School of Art and Design, as we ask our students through our GPS, Global Positioning Studies Initiative, to deeply consider place and space, how they make meaning and how they intersect with and can be expressed through art. Testify beyond place. I'd like us to consider a real place, but not one on a map, Afrolatcha. It is a word brought into being by Black Kentucky Poet Laureate Frank X. Walker after reading a dictionary definition of Appalachians as white mountain folk, a definition that rendered black lives invisible. Marie's work in all its forms testifies to Afrolatcha, past, present, and future. When I say forms, I'm not speaking of materials or media which span a broad range, but of forms, ways of expressing ideas. Marie is a social documentarian and writer. She was named the Fall 2022 Spring 20, or, I'm sorry, Fall 2020, Spring 2022, Lehman Brady Professor at Duke University Center for Documentary Studies. She is conducting an oral, his, oral history interviews and collaborating as she often does, on a book with a photojournalist, among other projects. Marie is a curator. She co-curated the pioneering exhibition Common Ground, Afrolatcha, where I'm from, at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center in Pittsburgh. And she is the founding curator of the Afrolatchian Artist Project, which has over 3,500 followers. Marie is a teacher and a mentor. She's been a visiting professor or fellow at several institutions, and at Duke, she taught a special course called Black Spaces Matter, Race, Place, Community, and Resilience. And I can testify to her mentoring. She made me believe I could teach. Marie is, as she says, a cultural pollinator. And in recognition of her community-based work, she was named a fellow in 21-22 to the Appalachian Leadership Institute, a leadership and economic development opportunity for Appalachians who are passionate about helping their communities thrive. Marie is an artist. She earned her BFA at the University of Georgia and her MFA at the Art Institute of Chicago. She is exhibited widely, including at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library and Museum in Austin, Texas, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC, and the Studio Museum of Harlem in New York City, among many, many others. Please join me tonight in welcoming this year's deemed distinguished lecturer, Marie Cochran. Wow. Okay. So, um, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> um, but I will say this before I forget, forget to start with this note. Um, this has been a long, jagged path. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to talk about an exhibition of that name in, in great detail, but um, it has for people of color in our region, but it's been jagged for all of us in this room because I'm going to talk about the last, you know, this experience that we had through um, what I call the triple pandemic. And that's why I changed my talk dramatically um, two nights ago because I felt that I did not need to simply do a great greatest hits of an artist and academic uh, and cultural pollinator. Um, Dr. Raymond did such a wonderful job, you know, giving you this sense of my um, professional life. So I wanted to 
introduce you to a little, some glimpses into my personal life that got me to this point because I think that you can connect in some ways because I wanted to speak to the times that we're living in today. So the first thing that I wanted to do is simply um, do an Afrolatcha acknowledgement to West Virginia. How many people know who that gentleman is? Oh, yes, you do. Because as it has been for my life in the last year, um, I had this moment where Dr. Raymond reminded me that she sat in the back of this very room listening to me give a presentation to students who were brought together for the summer under the auspices of the Jordan family, this wonderful arts camp that they've been doing for almost 40 years. And so you see that he passed away in 2019, but poet Norman Jordan is also the father of your beloved Eric Jordan, who is the um, programming director for the Center for Black Culture and Research on this campus. So we ha have a lot of acknowledgments to make. Um, I have my dear cousin, Dr. Pauline, who is in the audience, and I'm looking at my dear friend, Laurie Goh, who I met that same summer. So there's a lot of names I could mention, but I just wanted to put smiles on your faces so you could keep me from crying out of the sentimental moments that are in this, this space. So this is my Afrolatcha land acknowledgement by having um, the Afrolatchian poet Norman Jordan on the screen. So next up, um, meet my parents, circa 1960s. On the left, Mabel Brewer Cochran and Murray Cochran and my beloved brother, uh, now with the ancestors, Myron Tracy Cochran, and me. Um, and you'll see various hairstyles throughout this talk. <laughs> so um, I also have to give um, acknowledgement to them so that they can be in this space with me. All of the MCs in the room. And this is one of my favorite photographs of my parents on our property in Northeast Georgia. I bring you greetings from Stevens County, Tacoa, Georgia. Um, so when they see this YouTube video, they'll be able to say, oh yeah, you put us in there too. But as I said before, I'm doing things a little bit differently, so I wanna talk about how I got to my activism and advocacy by talking you through my life. So the first thing that I need to say is I learned civil rights at home. Um, no governor, no elected official, no public policy debate was involved in that. And I learned it at my parents' dining room, breakfast, all the meals table, because they had a story to tell about their experiences at work, their experiences as children of sharecroppers who actually did pick cotton, who were destined to be the help, if not for the civil rights movement. So I'm gonna show you a little clip of a documentary that was done about Georgia. It's called a whole series called Georgia Stories. And they broke it into education, the military, and various other parts of, of life. And I was featured in the segment on education. So you're gonna see a dramatic hairstyle change, <laughs> but slightly different 80s. Um, I was not in a hip hop group, but I looked like I was. And you'll also see that the space was at the High Museum of Art. For those of you who watched Wakanda, remember that scene, it's the same museum. That's my claim to fame, all right? So we'll watch this. Uh, it's just a brief um, glimpse into the story. There are different ways to approach history, a thousand different ways, but one of them is through art. A Georgia artist has created a work of art that reminds us of how schools were an important part of the civil rights movement. Marie Cochran is an artist who teaches at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro. And this is Freedom School, a work of art she created that was shown at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. 
When I first thought about doing a piece that was related to the civil rights movement, I tried to consider, you know, how it would relate to me personally instead of just picking a topic. And I realized that when um, I first started school, that was really my introduction to the civil rights movement because my parents chose to have me be one of the first children to desegregate the schools in my hometown in North Georgia. I began with this idea of the classroom because I think that it's an important spot to consider the civil rights movement. Um, education is one of the battle sites um, that had to be fought when you think about equal rights and justice. In creating her work of art, Marie made a room and filled it with images and objects that remind you of school. She thinks of the classroom as a battleground in African Americans' fight for equality in education. So she used burned desks and books to represent a place where a battle was fought. Sometimes art uses ordinary things as symbols to represent something else. For example, a desk might be a symbol of the student who sits at it. I put two um, children's desks on top. And way up top, if you can look and see, I have the names of children uh, engraved on those school desks. One says Johnny, one says Jamal, the other says Sally and Shalanda. So you think about the different kinds of children that would be in a classroom together. Um, I've got um, globes that represent the fact that you know, our country is uh, multicultural in that there are people from all over the world that live here, and that becomes part of our, our nation. And also this whole idea of the shackle, you know, when we think about you know, good and bad things that are part of our nation's history. The shackle is a reminder of what can hold people back. Other symbols come from Marie's childhood memories. Now, I pulled together um, remembrances of some of the children's rhymes that, that I recall from my childhood, and I took a real um, famous one, or one that most people remember, you know, that goes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I want you to save all your questions as you go through this so that we can get back to some of this because there's a lot of information here. I can also say that I sh shared a wall with Mel Chen. So I know Mel Chen, so it's like he's in the room today too. Um, but you can see this um, photograph of my kindergarten class and I almost disappear. I'm standing right next to my teacher. You can see me, you know, basically, maybe you can see the glimmer of my hair bow. Um, but at the same time that I was integrating the school system with all of these other children, um, my parents were integrating their workplace. So you had my mother and my father at Coates and Clark, which, you know, we talk a lot about um, the mines with, um, you know, coal mining in Appalachia, but textile mills also figure prominently in our rural communities. So you see my mother as the third person over in that photograph, and you see my father in the photograph as one of the men with the hat on the back row. So those are the things that we can keep in mind. When we talk about history and we talk about trying to understand it, if anybody was doing their math, you also realize that this, this happened 12 years after Brown versus Board of Education. I did not do the math and understand the significance of that until I did the show at the High Museum to realize that that was a negotiation in my hometown with all deliberate speed to let one more full class graduate before integration. We'll talk about that maybe in just a minute. So these were the conversations that I had at the dinner table that helped me to understand what it was like to work in a textile mill the night that Martin Luther King was shot, to understand what it was to work in the textile mill when you had to talk about work time and salary and um, whether or not you were going to have opportunities to be promoted and whether or not you were going to have enough money to send your child to college, whether or not you were going to get an FFA, FFA, FHA loan to build your home, which my parents were able to in this big rush, this big you know, ability to succeed as a result of the fight for civil rights through civil rights legislation. 
So part of that also comes with the time that I was born. I just feel like more and more I think about these times in my life. And literally, this is an important picture to figure into anything that I say about my life because on November 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. It was also my first birthday. So that's the time that I come into. And yes, I turned 60 last year. <laughs> it's also at the time where I was coming through elementary school and my very first, I, this is not my drawing, but we had a current events um, class and Ms. Vicki Barsh, I hope she's listening, had current event class and we did notebooks and I copied a drawing that was in a newspaper or a magazine. And summarily, the principal came in to our third grade class, told us that our teacher was in trouble, and picked up all of our copies, that particular edition, and we no longer could have our little newspaper for third grade anymore. So that was my first understanding of what backlash was like, about what censorship was like. But that's not the drawing. I probably will never see that drawing again in my life. So these little markers are for me to remember where I am in my story. Student activist part one. There are a lot of parts. But this is the one that I'm very proud of because by high school and now with a proclamation, I with other members of my high school, Helen Barrow, Helen Clark Barrow, hope you're listening, Virginia Baker, and teachers, Mr. L.J. Harrison, Ms. Anna Kennedy, had the first recognition of Black History Month in our rural community in 1979. And just two weeks ago, we had a proclamation to honor that milestone in our community. But really, I got into more of what I wanted to do to ask these questions and to address certain issues when I got to graduate school in Chicago. A lot happened at UGA but as an undergrad, but I really came into my own. Um, I used to be really quiet. Um, I was a shrinking violet, but I came into my own when I went to graduate school in Chicago, the first time I'd lived outside of the South. And I'm gonna move things along just so that you can see what the name of our show was. A group of students, and I see there are various students in here. I was a graduate student working with undergraduates. And we created an exhibition called A Part of the Whole. And it was meant to be a gathering of students of all colors. We now call it BIPOC. But this is before any real discussion, before people had even used the term multiculturalism. Um, and one of the artists in the show was Dred Scott Tyler. Some of you may know your art history. Yes, I was in grad school with him and we almost got shut down several times. We'll talk about this more because this was the artwork that he did. It was called, How Do You Properly, How Do You, and I've forgotten the title, How Do You Display the, the Proper Way to Display the U.S. Flag? Question mark. And so there he put an American flag, um, a comment book, and a collage of photographs that were um, placed so that in some ways it allowed the viewer to stand on the American flag. And through a series of events, this became a national outcry where not just the school had problems, but the museum itself lost funding from the state of Illinois based on this work. So we can talk more about that. And that was really my understanding of how an artwork as simple as this could draw so much ire and so much reaction simply by its presence. And that uh, image on the left you see is really put there by the police department to warn people that the work was going to be defended, but the flag should not be desecrated. 
I see you keep those questions. And then by the time that I had gotten my MFA and had gotten back to Georgia, you saw me um, with my high top fade teaching at Georgia Southern University, I came back galvanized. And I started to think about what I wanted to do with all this information that I had. So I started teaching classes, you know, surveys of African American art history, cultural diversity in American art. I had students that were, you know, pre-law that were going to be art teachers, just all the students from all over the campus that were able to take my classes. But a little thing happened while I was on campus. And our football team actually started to grow. And that particular campus was hosting the national championship on their campus. And this is the promo poster that was placed to get people to come from all over the country to South Georgia. And my students said, we talk about art. We talk about the power of imagery. So there was no way that I couldn't simply respond to this poster. And I didn't bring the letter, because we could do that in another time. But basically what I said was, this should not be censored. But we should talk about the fact that these images would be chosen, that this would be the only way that Southerners could think about promoting people to come to the South. And that it was even more egregious and disrespectful considering that the majority of the football players were black. So this led to a whole range of things, including death threats. For the very first time, it was not my third grade current events newspaper being silenced, but the possibility of me being silenced. And it was only through the support of my colleagues, the president of Georgia Southern University at the time, that I was able to survive this particular experience and we had meaningful conversations as a result of it. Because at the end of the day, the big question was, first of all, let me just say this. First of all, they said that I should go back where I came from. And they said that I must be some Yankee. And I'm like, I'm a Georgian. <laughs> so, and, and we could go on and on, but here was the thing but we had meaningful conversations about how do we embrace a place we love that is complicated without pulling out these simplistic symbols that mean nothing to us now. And if they do mean something to us now, we need to have that conversation as well. Moving right along. Activist Educator Part 2. Now, there's a lot of different campuses between here and there and, and everything, but this is where I get to the University of Georgia. And this is a different kind of activism in some ways because I was able to address an issue that was very important and then move and expand beyond it. What you see on the screen is a newspaper fold, you know, free newspaper, it's the flagpole, Maybe, no, this is the Athens Banner Herald, and it talks about the activities for the first annual Edward Wright Memorial Afrocentric Festival in downtown Athens. I didn't pull up a large picture, but if you see the photograph of the young man with the green shirt and the jeans, that's Edward Wright, and before we had Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and all these names that we know. This was a young man who left his home after a shift at a factory. For whatever reason, he had a crisis. His mother knew that he'd left the home. He was unarmed. He had no clothes on. She called to get assistance from the police. It was in the daytime. Edward Wright was shot and killed. 
So this is a whole decade before the racial reckoning that we've experienced. And so out of that pain, out of that sorrow, the black community and allies came together and had this festival. It only happened for a couple of years because it morphed into AthFest, which is now a celebration of my former classmates, um, Michael Stipe and all these other people and all the wonderful arts and musical legacy of Athens that you, some of you who are older especially may know about. But the first major arts festival was in honor of Mr. Edward Wright. And as a part of that, because of what I was already doing as a mentor and as a faculty member, a group of students came together around that time. And yes, that's me. You can't see my dreads, but there I am holding up the little us sign. But a group of students at the University of Georgia who were art majors. And we also realized that we found out about the name of the first African-American student to graduate with a, an art degree from the University of Georgia, Ms. Darlene Killian. And circa 1998, this group has continued to stay together, be together, and I have continued to see them go through their careers. The gentleman with the yellow hat, uh, Rodriguez Davis, is a tenured faculty at Grambling. Um, the young man, Jansen Robinson, is an artist and he's done various art pieces for films like Selma, et cetera, in the film industry. Jerusha Graham, uh, with the brown uh, shirt and the head wrap, is an incredible uh, printmaker and artist. Um, I could go on and on and on. The woman at the very bottom with the white shirt is a psychologist. She got an art degree, though, became a psychologist. And the young man just above me, um, to the left, was actually a, a swimmer and um, not, not an extra, but he was involved in the Wakanda film. Um, just recently, and they were, their crew was nominated for a SAG award for, um, and I can't think of what it's called, not extras, thank you, somebody help me out, but the people that do the, um, the tech with, um, with film, so they, he's nominated for a SAG award. And this is an uh, actual gathering that we had 20 years after our beginning uh, at an exhibition, and you can see all of the different artists as well. And this is all of us together at that gathering many years later. Um, there's an artist by the name of Augusta Savage who was well known in the Harlem Renaissance. And she mentored Jacob Lawrence and many other artists. And she said, I do not need, and I paraphrase, a monument because my students are my monument. Those students, among others, are my monument. So... Now we make a slight maneuver over into what is the work of my life. Because all of that sort of tells you that I've always thought about the things that are around me and the things that are happening to me and the importance of being engaged in a social way, in an, in an activist way. And when I started teaching at Western Carolina University, that's when I started to think a little bit more about where I'm from, and not thinking of it as just a rural community that's not Atlanta, that's up in Georgia, but as Afrolatcha. And I hope you can see this pretty well, but those are those same parents that I showed you earlier. This is them when I was a glimmer in my father's eye. Um, and they are on vacation Cherokee, North Carolina, the Kuala Boundary. So what I'm going to do for a minute is I'm going to read you some excerpts from my essay, I Pledge Allegiance to Appalachia. Being a black person from Appalachia can be summed up in that old Facebook relationship status. It's complicated. During my childhood, I enjoyed The Waltons, a popular 1970s TV show about a hard scrabble white family in the Virginia mountains, as much as I enjoyed Good Times, the story of an irrepressible black family in Chicago's Cabrini Green public housing community. 
My black friends from Atlanta and other cities look askance when I mention I had simultaneous crushes on the sensitive aspiring writer John Boy, the eldest son of the Walton family, and Michael Evans, the smart, politically conscious youngest child on Good Times. Wow, that says a lot about me. I'm used to this reaction. I've always been teased because I was born and raised in the foothills of the Georgia Appalachian Mountains, a place not known for having black communities or deep south chocolate cities. I'm crafting these emotions from, into sentences as this native daughter returned to Georgia after many years away, and I'm still sorting out how I feel about this place called home. I was born in Toccoa in Stevens County, even these place names express the dissonance I feel about my geographic roots. Tacoa is a word of Cherokee origin. Almost every local chamber of commerce brochure claims that translated into English it means the beautiful, though it was probably derived from Taguahi, meaning Catawba place. My high school mascot is still the Indians, boldly and inaccurately adorned in Plains Indian headgear. There was hardly any mention in our history classes of the Trail of Tears that removed indigenous people from this area of Northeast Georgia. Nothing about the reasons why and no thoughtful contemporary attempt to connect with the culture we claim to honor on the athletic field. The county is named after Alexander H. Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy during the Civil War. He is commemorated with a bronze plaque on the grounds of the county courthouse. The official marker does not refer to his infamous cornerstone address delivered in Savannah, March 1861. There, he stated the logic behind the Confederacy's creation, and I quote, its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition." End quote. Clearly there was no place in Stephen's vision for me, but the Confederacy did not prevail. I'm a black female who was a first generation college student. My parents spent their teens being the help, then labored in the textile mills as adults. I am the grandchild of sharecroppers and the great grand of enslaved people. As an heir to the civil rights movement, I claim the freedom to become an artist, curator, and educator. I also embrace the role of cultural pollinator. I've earned two degrees. Much of my work connects to grassroots communities. I am a black Southerner, and my experience, though it do not defies the white hillbilly stereotype, is assuredly Appalachian. Because it is a stereotype. These are all tropes. These are all stereotypes. I missed. I went over the, the discussion about the fact that we have these three streams that come through, indigenous, European, and African, in the beginning story. But now there are other streams that are Asian, that are Latinx, et cetera, et cetera. So responding to the persistent erasure of our presence, I often say small numbers, tremendous impact. The historic impact of grassroots black folks upon these ancient mountains can be found in a range of examples. Um, yet for me, the most poignant and ironic example of the intersection of cultures is in the region is the banjo itself, which is quintessentially Appalachian and has African roots. Shout out time. Carter G. Woodson. The founder of Black History Week that became Black History Month with roots in West Virginia. Henry Louis Gates, the renowned scholar of black literature and culture, grew up in the mill town of Piedmont, West Virginia. Woo woo! And where am I going? Let me see. And um, boosted the popularity of genealogy in this country. Appalachia gave us recording artists like Nina Simone, Bill Withers, Roberta Flack, as well as August Wilson, Nikki Giovanni, to name a few. Musical giants even made their mark in my tiny hometown. I'll tell you more about this later. James Brown came to Toccoa, Georgia. He was born in Augusta. James Brown came to Toccoa, Georgia. <laughs> Fleeing a tumultuous childhood and a perilous future, he healed his spirit and birthed his musical prowess in the shadow of Currahee Mountain. 
the blues vocalist and vaudeville performer Ida Cox was also born in Tacoa. Her enslaved parents probably worked on the Riverside Plantation before she fled as a teenager to sing about daily struggles and sexual liberation in the 1930s, going on to fame as a pro prolific composer and band leader. Her song, While Women Don't Get the Blues, is largely recognized as an early feminist anthem. I'll give you a link so you can see the rest of the, the essay, but we got to move on. So there's richness here beyond these numbers. And I have to do this little disclaimer. How many have read this wonderful autobiography by Dr. William Turner Carl Har called Harlan Renaissance? Okay, only a few. Well, my name is in it, but not necessarily for good reasons. Because even as we talk about these shifts and these moves, um, coming up with these terms very often is a generational thing. And Dr. Turner is a pioneer of the study of black people in Appalachia going back to the 1980s, his entire career. But some whippersnappers came around in the 1990s and invented this word, Afrolatcha. Dr. Turner and I have come to a meeting of the minds, but he does not like the term. So when you read my name in his book, you'll understand that we've come to a meeting of the minds. Because even in my own family, these names that we call ourselves, going from Negro to colored. There were people who hated the term black. There were people who hated the term African-American. But I found this wonderful dialogue online between him and Bell Hooks and their mutual dislike for the term. But in the same conversation, they said that we have a right individually to call ourselves what we want to be called. So there, my work is done with that. <laughs> and I'm going to show you the full length overview that explains how the Afrolatchian Artist Project came to be. I'm gonna play it in this entire We're all here because of the fact that we are undervalued, you know, as artists and we're always looked up, we're, we're secondary. And we're so. told that we would best suit our talents to become pipe fitters or something more practical. And this is uh, one, it was a white professor that told us that. She said, honey, colored people can't be artists. Um, just having that kind of uh, support within the family unit made it so that when I experienced opposition from outside, I already had the, um, the armor I needed to deflect that. In the fifth grade in this trophies class, when we had to stand up and say what we wanted to be when we grew up, uh, I took that challenge and I stood up and said I wanted to be an artist when I grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the kids at lab, I, at recess, I told them I couldn't play with them anymore because I could only play with people who believed in me. I've always been a creative person but never really had a chance to really uh, express myself. So, something like being there, you know, people really don't have um, that big of appreciation for artists. Uh. My name is Marie Cochran, and I was born and raised in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. I am an Appalachian artist. 20 years ago, a group of writers, black writers from Kentucky, coined the term Appalachia. Two years ago at a gathering, it occurred to me that musical groups like the Carolina Chocolate Drops had embraced the term. There was a word. There was a song, but where were the visual artists? Frank X. Walker, a founding member of the Afrolatchian Poets, extended his hand across the table and he said, you invite them. And that was when my journey began. Two years later, I've curated an exhibition of Afrolatchian artists at the August Wilson Center in Pittsburgh. The name of the show is Common Ground Afrolatchia, where I'm from. 
This particular exhibition brings together 31 artists of various ages working in a variety of media. Afrolatcha identifies the African presence in these mountains. For too long, the contribution of African Americans to American culture has been neglected. Until recently, our contribution to Appalachian culture has been denied. For instance, how many folks know that the banjo, which is so integral to Appalachian music, has African roots? The Afrolatchian Visual Artist Project was created to showcase the artwork. The exhibition represents the completion of the first phase. In the next phase, I feel a sense of urgency. Many of the artists are over the age of 60. Oh, my name is Mayo Tahil. Green Davis, Willis Green Davis. Newman Jackson. I'm looking at Paul Ramey. I am Elizabeth Ash Douglas. I'm uh, Errol Butchie, Mobutu Reynolds. Charlotte Ka. My name is Joanne Bates, Valeria Watson Deuce. My name is Sammy Lewis Nicely. How do you feel about being a part of this exhibition um, with all of us here? Honored um, because they're pioneers. We felt so isolated at the time. We didn't know what Bean Davis, we didn't know people were, especially African Americans, African American artists. And we saw Mr. Davis at a conference in Texas. And I rightly thought, wow, we're not the only ones. There's somebody out there in the world that's living, thriving as an artist. They are the pioneers who have overcome racial prejudice and other barriers. It's time to give these artists the recognition that they so richly deserve. And it makes us feel like, wow, you know, there's somebody out there that we can look up to and, you know, and pretty soon we're going to have to pass that baton on to someone else. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it by myself. You know, I had other people that supported us along the way. I need your support to take this next step so that I, along with my team, can travel to the places where these artists live and work to capture their life story. This will begin the process of creating an archive of Afrolatchian artists. Do you agree that African American cultural traditions or contributions are undervalued? Are you surprised to learn about the rich, literary, musical, and visual arts traditions in Appalachia? If you answer yes to any of these questions, then you owe it to yourself to make a pledge. I thank you on behalf of all the future generations of Afrolatchian artists. trying to do right here to create a vehicle in which we can all ride. Okay, so to explain, um, yes, that was a Kickstarter film. And it really led me to the growing numbers of people who found me from around the region, around the country to support this work. And it reminds me of the unfinished work let yet to do because that was 10 years ago. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that with the young folks about how long it takes to do something. And the Fellowship at the Center for Documentary Studies has just now gotten me to the resources to be able to complete that, um, you know, the, the obligation that I, you know, embrace. You know, it's, it's not any kind of um, uh, burden in any way. And as a result of being in Western North Carolina and meeting people who then introduced me to the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and I saw them open for Taj Mahal at the Orange Peel before they won the Grammy. I, I called Dom Flemons a close friend, um, 
and, you know, those connections along the, the way, I was able to literally look around where I was in Western North Carolina and find out about the story behind the film that Dr. Raymond told you about. So we now have the names of everyone in that photograph to dig through the archives, those trustees of the Mount Zion, AME Zion Church, who were asked with no answer except yes, to destroy their church, disinter their family members on the behest of the, the campus to expand and build a dormitory on the site of their church and their graves. And, you know, even as we have these conversations about the racial reckoning, there's often the first reaction to say that they were paid as if that's a great thing because we know that 99.9% .9 of the time when these actions take place that people are not asked and they are not paid. But it doesn't justify the act. But we have their photographs and the church was moved literally across the street where it stands today and was built by and designed by a black architect. So when you go and see the film upstairs, you can think about this and think about the context and how it relates to people being removed and erased over time. And yes, this has happened to poor people of all races. We know that from our family stories. We know that from historical record, but what I often say is it becomes insult to injury when it comes to people of color. Because very often, then the story is erased. And it adds to that long story of how we even got to this country as property. So I welcome the very nuanced, the very complex conversations that we can have about these things so that we can deepen our understanding and we don't repeat those things as we talk about development, city planning, gentrification, wealth building, generational and otherwise amongst ourselves because it's the people who go through universities and colleges that are the people who help make those decisions, whether we're elected officials or not. And yes, I am using my platform tonight, and that's why I changed my talk, because it is so important. I'm going to skip over the excerpt because we're going to be able to see the um, film upstairs. And I'd like you to take some time with it because it will be up through um, the end of this month but I'm gonna very briefly talk about this time that we've been through, which is a triple pandemic, racial reckoning, global pandemic, and assault on truth. Because that's the title that I used when I did my public talk to end my fellowship, the Lehman Brady Fellowship, that was shared between Duke University Center for Documentary Studies and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And that's a photograph of me on the top of Water Rock Knob in North Carolina. Um, it, it really captured how I felt during the pandemic, you know, as a time of reflection, as a time that would even allow me to be able to have a talk like this, because these things were happening that have changed our nation. And I have this wonderful, it's not gonna do the interactive, but just simply trying to hone in on where we are right now, if you can see where West Virginia is and North Georgia is at the bottom, all these different Black Lives Matter protests. They weren't just in Chicago and Atlanta and New York and Los Angeles. Some of you may have been participants in some of those protests, but it was a coming together where we started to talk about these dialogues that we should have. And very quickly, since it was mentioned in some of the um, PR, I was able to work on a Black Lives Matter street mural in Asheville with um, three other artists, and literally we had each word. Um, we were the lead artists and designers 
Um, Black was by Joseph Beer Pearson. Um, Matter, um, Black was by Joseph Pearson. Lies by Jenny Pickens, and I did Matters. And we were able to hire, literally, students, hire young students to work with us on the painting of the mural. And the um, impetus for this was because of the 80-something the foot tall Vance Monument in the middle of downtown. If you've ever been to Asheville, can't find it anymore because we had no idea. We wanted to have the mural, which in fact was around the base of this monument as a way to bring the discussion to the public, that monument was removed. It is no longer there. The city of Asheville is still in discussions about what will happen to that space, but it was in honor of the Confederate governor of the state of North Carolina, Zebulon Vance. That's an aerial view of the um, street mural. Those are all the artists who are involved in the painting and this is my team because Matters was facing the Asheville Art Museum. So of course we had to pose in front of the art museum. So um, I think I'm just gonna stop here. I was gonna give you a little taste of an art history um, lesson that I've done, but I really think that it's, I really want to have conversation from you and I'll just say that as a closing comment that this experience of being a black person in Appalachia is not confined to the geographic bounds of the Appalachian Regional Commission, which I love because I'm now an alumni of the Leadership Institute. But it's really this, this discussion about the mountains, the, the valleys, and the hollers, the different places that we live and what we have in common and what we want this place to be going into the future. And I think that even in the context of these larger national discussions, we can have these discussions at home. You saw the map. You know, these are things that touch all of us. Um, I'm blanking on names and I really wish I could remember. I'm having a hard time, but there's an incredible musician, white musician, who did a song that was inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. And he was talking about how his family members, his friends would feel if they had to in have a negative encounter with police officers because they were riding around in their truck with their rifle in the gun rack, or if they were speeding, wanting to take their grandmother to the doctor and they were stopped because they had a broken tail light. Um, and he was making this connection between people and situations to help them understand that these issues that we're grappling with have a historic connection to the way that we interact with racism but it's also about people who don't have power, people who don't feel like they have a voice, people who feel like they're different and not embraced and not accepted. So these are my notes from an Afrolatian daughter shared with you today. Thank you. I'll think of his name later. <laughs> is it Tyler, Tyler, Tyler? Tell me somebody. Who is it? Tyler Childers. Thank you. That's my dude. That's exactly it. Because when I find these things, see, now y'all got, now you, look it up. Not just Carolina Chocolate drop, Drops, but Tyler Childers. And it just came to me as I was talking to all of my friends who are writers, people that I love, like I gotta do the shout out, David Joy in Western North Carolina, Ron Rash, who told me after I wrote that essay that I wrote the beginnings of what would be a memoir. Thank you. Questions? Anybody? 
Oh, don't be shy. Come on. You got something to ask me about. Thank you for everything you, you said, Lorraine. Can you speak a little bit about the collaborative nature of your work? I, I, there's always been a lot of people around you. And how does that move you forward or a reflection on that? That's a very good question because I think, you know, I, I purposely did not show you a lot of my work except for that very first piece, which was really like a breakthrough piece because literally it was at the High Museum of Art and it went to the Smithsonian. Um, but it's an installation piece, so um, it's not anybody's collection. Uh, but I'm going to get to that pretty soon because I've got drawings. But, and, and there's a, a, a permanent um, sculpture a stage that I did that was paid for by the Olympic Games in Atlanta. There's a, you can go and see my work. But there was a certain point where I said to myself, and I'm not being braggadocious because I'm 60. Uh, I can say it. I'm an elder now. But I, I said I could be a famous artist and at the same, because I went to some incredible schools. I mean, the Ford Foundation paid for me to go to the School of the Art Institute. You know, all of those different scholarships that I had available paid for me to go to the University of Georgia. My parents were not that happy when I said that I had all these great grades and I was going to be an art major. And, you know, my mother and father could tell you, it's like they had a little argument there that seemed like, you. But, but I managed to get the funding to go. So I had all the, the, the chips to, to turn in to, to do certain things. But I said to myself, I see something missing in this story. And when I found out that I could write, that I could curate in particular, especially when it came to the Afrolatcha part, I said, this is where I can bring people along. Because there's a certain, I've seen it in my friends, and I won't name names, but you know, the names were mentioned, that they feel lonely, they feel isolated, they feel, and they feel uncomfortable sometimes being held up as these icons of the art world. And there's a certain performative part of it that I didn't want to participate in. So, but when I put together a group of people and curated work, then when I had a show, there were like 10 other people with me at that exhibition, other people that they could talk to. And what I love about you know, the whole, you know, it's a Malcolm Gladwell thing about cultural pollinator, is I introduced people who then introduced other people together. And it became like this wonderful synergy, uh, synergy where, like I said about the monument thing, you know, people could, if they thought about others, oh, oh yeah, Marie introduced us. But then they could forget that I introduced them. It didn't matter. That's where the selflessness comes in because I really it didn't matter because I just wanted this, something to move quicker. Let's say if you run fast alone, you, you run alone, you run faster, run together, you go farther. That's an African proverb. I'm not saying it very well, but it's true. And also I was taught by people like that, whether it be L.J. Harrison, Anna Kennedy, other people around me, the late Sammy Nicely, who was in that videotape from East Tennessee, you know, where you bring these people together and then you get more out of the experience. It magnifies what you're accomplishing because even when we talk about stereotypes, they could point to you and say you're an exception. Thank you, because you just helped me to understand. They can point to you, because there have been, I mean, I could have brought out the painting of the banjo lesson by Henry O. Tanner in the 1800s. And they point to him and they say, he was an exception. So basically, I embraced the whole thing about Afrolatcha with the music and the art and the writing, because I saw a movement. And yes, you could say branding if you want to, but then you could say branding for every art movement, including the Harlem Renaissance. You know, Clement Greenberg had a plan for abstract expressionists. <laughs> it was a marketing plan. But we have a cultural plan in the work that we do. So.
Oh, oh, that, look at what I ended up on. Let me do this real quick. I didn't even know. So I wanted to show you um, Norman Rockwell, the problem we all live with, but around the same time talking about desegregation, you have this painting by Jacob Lawrence called The Ordeal of Alice, where the little girl is punctured by arrows like St. Sebastian. And then you have Mike Lukovich, who had an art history class. Thank you, because I put all this in there. And he did a riff off of Norman Rockwell that says, but I don't want to be protected from black history. Well, he could have easily said, I don't want to be protected from American history. Does that answer your question? I think it affects everybody because we're really, um, we're trying to figure out, like, like I, I talk to some young people sometimes and it's because civics is not taught, they say, well, do I have a right to fill in the blank? I think it's really had us, I'm seeing heads nod, because I think it's really had a lot of people begin to ask themselves, what is democracy? Um, there was even someone in my hometown once that said, well, do you have to be a business owner to run for public office? And this is somebody who'd gotten a college degree. And basically what she was seeing is that everybody who was in my small town was a business owner. And she was just making the logical leap. And so then there's this chilling effect. So even if you know things to be incorrect, you're wondering about the consequences. Because if you watch the full version of the Georgia Stories interview, you see my parents being um, talked to because at this uh, time, the school, the colored school continued for one more year beyond integration. And so parents had to decide if they were gonna send their children or not. And my mother's very like defiant, strong, my father as well, but he was thinking, you know, do I want to lose my job? But they said, but the law is behind us. But we're going to take that chance. To, and even when we talk about the 12 years it took before the schools were integrated, there were black people who needed to have, who decided so it was good to keep the colored school open for another 12 years. You know why? Because when the schools were integrated, most of those teachers lost their jobs because they were not going to be given jobs in the integrated school. All of the principals, all of the administrators lost their jobs. That's, that's the untold story about American history. So in these areas where we have these incredible black people they had to leave West Virginia. They had to leave North Georgia. That's why they went to um, Ohio or to, you know, I don't know, to, to New York, to Chicago, wherever they went outside of the region because they were overqualified and could not stay. I'm even facing that now in my situation to navigate how I can live my life and do my work in my hometown. Now, of course, we can say that's across the board, but insult to injury, because there are some college educated natives of my hometown who have jobs with the city, with colleges, whatever, you know what I'm saying. So that's the thing. But in spite of that, I'm inspired by all of the people who daily, not just because of a football poster, but daily had their lives challenged and still did the work. And were not killed and accomplished so much. Because I, when I was in graduate school, one of the things that we did um, is incredible professional art school. 
was had a class because it was a liberal arts you know training even though you were pretty much there for a professional art school like the Art Institute and we interviewed people who were involved in the civil rights movement a lot of them were white um, now professionals you know lawyers or whatever and had been involved in Freedom Summer and one thing will always stick in my mind because we were asking them you know how could you do this knowing that at any time somebody could kill you and he said that wasn't the issue he said the issue was asking ourselves what if we lived What if we lived? What were we going to do with our lives after this incredible experience? Because we're all going to die. Surprise. <laughs> like my grandmama said, said Grandmother um, Bernice Brewer, we're not here to stay. So what are we going to do with that time that we have? And we learned that through the pandemic. I came down hard and heavy on you guys. <laughs> but there's joy. There's joy in the journey. And that's really. Right. Right. Well, and I didn't do a good job of repeating the questions that were asked, so I'll have to do that real quick because maybe it just seemed like I was doing this real big monologue. But um, somebody was just talking, they all, you've referred to a book called The Warmth of Other Sons, the whole idea of, um, you know, the great migration and the whole, the big issue for our region about brain drain, you know, where people who are talented and have so much potential very often let's say it for you're you're forced to leave but here's the thing I think that we always have to plan our return because I was gone obviously I mean I didn't show up you know but it's like and even your return might be resources might be mentoring a young person might be holding on to the family land might be any number of things but it's like you can't just show up for the chicken dinner and the plaque at the end of your career. That's criminal. Because that just perpetuates that thing of, I gotta get out of here, I gotta get out of here. And you know, and then for the people who stay, it diminishes what they've done in the staying by not leaving. Whether they went to college or not, whatever, by raising their families and hold and doing the things every day or whatever, you know. It's like it, it, that, it's an obligation that I welcome. For some people, I'm like, you're back. It's like, yeah. But they're seeing these things that I've managed to be able to do. And again, just by virtue of encouragement of people and vigilance, like you were saying about the whole idea of people feeling like there, there is no um, accountability that somebody is not going to come to their aid, that the bullies are going to prevail because ain't nobody watching. You know, so the thing is, I feel that sense of connection. And even when I was in Chicago, very often, I would be introduced to people and I'd say, I'm from Tacoma, not Tacoma. <laughs> it's in Georgia. No, I'm not from Atlanta. I'm from the, you know, I would do all these different things and I would say, and somebody caught me and I said, oh, I'm going back one day. And I didn't even know I was saying it, but I would say it, I'm going back one day. Well, please join us upstairs, everyone, and bring, thank you. Thank you.